Okay, thank you. By the way, I have tendency of speaking very loud, so if it's too loud, just let them know. They will tune it down. I will try to keep my voice normal, which is essentially very loud. Okay, let's talk about domain-driven design. So there will be a couple of, this is, this is a little bit different presentation from most of the presentations that you kind of experienced throughout today. So half of the presentations were about technical details of some specific Java framework, and half of this were about AI. Yes, so this is a hot topic. The, the best way to just be on a presentation now, just to put AI somewhere in the title, and then you have guaranteed full board. However, this is one of the talks that this is like most important for the developers and for people working on software projects. This is essentially what I can call foundation. And that's, uh, I am really like to see full, full room of people. So let's jump into it. By the way, who have heard about domain-driven design? Most of you. Who has implemented or worked on a project with domain-driven design? Mm, okay, still many people. Is it easy to implement it? Okay, almost no hands. That, you know, that's the very important thing to understand and separate what's really domain-driven design and what's not, and just to put and just give you help with, for those experienced with, uh, with domain-driven design, it will help you just to make more sense of it. And for those that don't know it, about this, you will end up learning about why it's useful. So a word about myself, so I'm running training in event storming, uh, architecture, domain-driven design, and TDD. I have 17 years of professional experience, give or take some, I think give, and uh, co-owner instructor at Trainee Tech and hands-on architect and team lead at Mintra, where we build a big e-learning platform for very big companies, usually related to oil and Scandinavia. At the last slide of the whole talk, we'll have QR code to contact me and as well the link to the slides and QR code to the slides. Let's start with the questions. I will just ask you four questions and I would like to see your reaction to, our, to those. So, do you feel confident in understanding of the business aspects of your project? Hands up. Okay, like one quarter, maybe one fifth, but it means that four fifths are not, okay? Now, what about this? Are the business needs in your project communicated clearly and are easy to implement? Hands up, obviously. Like, five hands. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's about this, uh, the number I, I was kind of like uh, expecting to have, maybe a little bit too low. However, is it, is it a problem? It is a problem. All right, now, do you spend a lot of time reading and understanding code to solve bugs? So hands up, like half of the half of the people. So the others probably are not coding. Yes, <laughs> that's generated AI picture, obviously obligatory. Now, one more question: Is the model you work on too large to fully understand? So who worked on a model where you start to feel like this? I work like this, just like gigantic headaches, just you can't fit it in your head, okay? You, you touch one thing and then several others just falls as dominoes, yes? Does it ring a bell? Most probably. That's why domain-driven design is really important, okay? And now, this is a very fun question. So let's start with this question. Would you invest six months of two senior developers' time to, to implement a date time library supporting time zones. And just let's go back to 2007. In 2007, there, neither Java nor C Sharp had any really good support for time zones. Okay? And now the question is what, what's the answer? So, how many of you would uh, implement? Would uh, spend two senior developers' time for six months? How many hands are up? How many says no? More? And uh, the, re the real answer is, it depends. Okay, obviously it's very easy to say it depends, you know, like, but it wouldn't be fun if we wouldn't tell or ask about uh, or just discuss what it depends on. Because the whole beauty of the domain-driven design is just it's contextual. 
it essentially depends. And let's talk about this example. So let's say we generate, we try to create a web page, okay? And one UX designer somehow sneaked in or like one client wanted to have like a clock in the corner with a time zone of, you know, like uh, they bought something in New York, so they, we should just show them a clock with a time zone, you, you know, with their correct uh, time zone, okay? Is it, is it really sensible to invest these six months under those conditions? It's ridiculous, yes? Like, who, who would do that, okay? But now let's, let's think about different things. So now let's think we write software to help move those things from point A to B. This is an uh, example from the book. So there is maybe a few billions of dollars on that, on that ship, okay? Now we need to move it from, let's say, London to Singapore, and we will just go through many and several time zones. And if you will fail to meet that line, or you will you're miss a spot where you need to deliver those, maybe you will have to pay in insurance damages for a lot of money, okay? Will we invest, under those conditions, will we invest time to implement this daytime library? This is the core of the business, yes? So it really depends. But now, one more question. How many of you found yourselves or maybe your colleagues just spending unreasonable amounts of time of trying to compare to libraries, trying to choose a specific technical details or play with libraries on technical level instead of focusing what was really important to the project. Do you know those guys that why is he doing this for a month he's comparing this and that? So have you experienced this kind of thing that people Forofly tried to focus on technical details instead of business sides of what's really important. So I, I think many of you, for sure. That's why domain driven design is important thing. So Eric Evans wrote this book with uh, some with uh, some with uh, something in his mind. So in nineties he was working in uh, somewhere in New York area and they used uh, small talk back then and they had those beautiful let's say, a good team of developers, and they were able to provide solutions that were successfully uh, delivering to the clients what they are needs. And they had those nice concepts that they used across those boards. And then, unfortunately, Java 2 EE, uh, Java 2 EE came on the scene. So who of you have heard or worked with Java 2 EE? Not many of you, but that's good. For those of you was it easy or fun to work with? It's like no one wants to mention about that, you know, like that's uh, the reason for it is that there was whatever you thought about J2E, it was only wh what you re can remember. It was fighting against technical details, application servers, problems with deployments. It was so-called business components, but we were finding ourselves just fighting with this nightmare of technical details. And that was very far away from focusing on what's really important. And what's important? It's important to solve the business, business problems for companies. Now, there are some common misconceptions. There will be three. And during the talk, I will talk about all of them and we'll explain why they, they kind of fail. So the most common misconception and is this, that if you use aggregates, repositories, entities, events, value objects, services in your code, that it equals that you are using domain-driven design. So who had this misconception? I will raise my hand because I had this mis misconception in 2010. So no one has this misconception. Only one person, or maybe there are a few people, uh, but a bit shy. It's a misconception. So domain-driven design is not about this. So on one tweet from domain-driven, uh, from Eric Evans, someone asked him, what DDD is for you? And he said, nothing in particular related to the code. So those are technical patterns. You can implement, uh, you can use though, but those are essentially design patterns just uh, working against, just trying to fix some nice, uh, use business patterns. But this is not the clue. This is not the, what domain-driven design focus is on. There is another misconception that if you use anemic model, do you know what anemic model is? Have you heard about this? 
So those are essentially data structures without any behavior. Behavior is only in services. So you have services that do all it all, and you have only DTOs uh, that are data structure, okay? This is essentially anemic model. There will be a reference to the Martin Fowler article. It's essentially uh, sometimes called anti-pattern. But if you use, the misconception is this. If you use anemic model, you are not using domain-driven design. It's as well a misconception because domain-driven di design doesn't care about this. You know, I will th this will be very clear later on in the, in the, in the talk. But this one is, will be relate more. If you use microservices, then definitely use domain-driven design, okay? Not really. You, you can obviously implement domain uh, you can implement microservices and don't follow domain-driven design, and you can fail spectacularly. So many, uh, many teams that think that they build microservices end up with distributed monolith. I will give an example of how I think about distributed monolith on one of the slides in the future, e on the, uh, later on. Now, so what domain-driven design is about? It's not about elegant code or any particular methodology, okay? It is about providing value to the, to the companies, okay? This is this laser focus on helping companies to just do something. This is, this is the domain-driven design, like, uh, expressed in one sentence. But now, why domain-driven design matters? Because that's not all. There will be many tools that it helps us with. So first, laser focus on what really matters. Just try to help company. You will be more valuable for them later on, okay? Second thing, to make communication between people, departments, and teams more effective. And there will be a notion of ubiquitous language and bounded context. We will drill into this. Then we will choose, be strategic. We will choose what's really important to work on. And then we will have as well possibilities how to manipulate multiple models in our systems. And at the last thing, it will be mentioned that we can use tactical domain-driven design, which is the patterns I mentioned on one of the misconceptions. So now, is it clear for you what's domain? Hands up. Okay, not many people. Okay, do you know what's the difference between domain and model? Hands up. Okay, so this is important to tell it. So when, when I started to read a book, I read it once, I thought I understood it all, and then something didn't click in my mind. Then I read it again, and then I understood that the first time I read it, I understood nothing. So then I read it third time and watched some videos of Eric Evans explaining things, and then finally understood. But uh, that was one of the things it was hard to grasp. What's the difference between model and model? Okay? So the domain is essentially a sphere of knowledge representing the main business of a company, or maybe area, sector, or process within a company. There will be many examples in a second. And it's essentially problem space. Well, what it is, it's essentially a theater where you can have many different kinds of problems or performances to play. And what are examples? So for example, if you have meteorology, so everything related to atmospheric science and data related to weather patterns, there is a huge amount of knowledge related to this. Okay? So this is a problem space. Now, you choose a particular problem, and, all of kind of the, uh, and then model is a solution to that problem. Another example of domain, for example, warehouse management, inventory levels, and so on. So this is another huge, big area where there are, it has its own sets of problems, okay? Again, transportation systems, yet another domain. And for example, banking, financial transactions, patterns of fraud. This is yet another, okay? So those are domains, so examples of domains. This is a problem space. Now, we have four examples, but let's focus on this one. I'm not sure if the font is visible, but let's just read it. So we have a domain, which is banking financial transaction patterns of fraud, okay? Now, so this is a problem space. Now we choose one particular problem from this problem space. We would like to detect and prevent, you know, some fraud, fraudulent transactions in real time, okay? We chose one problem, and now we go to the model side. Now, the model is a solution to that particular problem. And that's a difference. So one model is a solution, and domain is the sphere of knowledge, and we have a problem in between. And let's talk models. 
So I will like I like this example. It's very visual and uh, very it can be understood by all. So let's say we are in domain cartographic geospatial data transportation network. It's hard to understand what it is, but we have a problem. We need an application for route planning. We need to assist users in efficiently moving from one place to another. So from A to B, do we have this kind of application? What comes to your mind? Uh, Google Maps, okay. So obviously we have Google Maps. I'm not reading minds, obviously. But is it all? Is it the one model that, that, that works under all conditions? No, we have many other models. So Google Maps works well in cities or in between the cities. But if you will think close enough, is Google Maps solving this problem, marine navigation system? What you are in the sea, if you own a boat, OK? I don't think many people here. Or you are underwater. Will you use Google Maps? Probably not many of you used it. But what about mountain navigation system? Will you use your... Uh, um, phone in very high mountains and be sure that it won't, uh, it will give you a proper tracks. That's maybe you can die if you use it, yes? And what about your navigation system? We'll use Google Maps when you operate like aeroplane. And you can have a different model, a classical one. You can use classical physical models. You see, there, there was a very specific problem that Google uh, uh, fixed and uh, just solved. So they had this gigantic domain, and they chose a very specific problem. Move, uh, uh, assist, assist people from moving A to B, but in cities or between the cities or between countries. That's it. But, and they, but there are still many different models solving other things. So what, what's the model is a very simplistic representation of the domain, focusing on very specific problem to address specific, to solve one specific problem. So it means that all models are wrong. And uh, I, we will talk about the big models in a second. So we can't capture every possible aspect of reality inside one model. By the way, in 2009, I worked on one system. And uh, we had this very good analyst that tried to essentially uh, give and present all aspects of reality in that project. So we ended up with uh, about with 100 entities, and everything was connected to everything like many to many. Like there was not like simple things, you know, like it was because in a real board, you will be able to con find connection between everything many to many, yes? Was it fun to work with this project as developer? Hell no. Was it fast? Hell no, lazy initialization had to be everywhere. Did it fail? Yes, it did, yes. So who worked on this kind of problem where the model was way too big and we tried to fit too many things in there? Was it fun? No hands, yeah. So all models are wrong, and that's fine. We can be wrong, but it, we can solve a ver very nicely a particular problem. So, and this, there is a quote, the map is not the territory. So the map that we draw is not essentially ter territory. That's how you should think about models. They can be simplified, and that's okay. So models live in the solution space. Okay, now, a word on big models. So over here we have, we have this distributed monolith or a monolith. It looks nice, okay, because there are some names over here, okay, however, Obviously, it's a monolith. Everything is tightly coupled, OK? If you use a SQL databases, if you try to make sense of it, you will end up with this kind of thing underneath, yes? Uh, you can't find like specific areas which are not connected uh, with others. It will be very hard to work with this kind of system. So this, those two pictures don't do justice for the big models, because everyone has experience with them, but how it really is Big models aren't that fun to work with. This is a spaghetti, by the way, if it's not visible. So you try to touch reports, and you break billing. Yes? So this is, this is essentially uh, monolith. So this is the big model in working. I tried to generate one more, big ball more of mud. But at least we can put a nice front end on it, yes? You see, colorful labels. All right. 
But is it easy to move this whole ball? This, this is how I imagine the big models. This is not fun at all to work with. Okay? You can't touch something without having some disastrous um, side effects in other parts. So obviously, having many smaller and focused models works better. We have a smaller cognitive load. Cognitive load is this, this, this device is the real problem. Okay? We can't fit the big models in our heads. We can just, I can work nicely with the 30 entities, but if we, I'm talking about, one, about 200 or 300, it just starts to get blurry. I will have maybe this part nicely uh, in my head, but I won't know what's happening everywhere else. It's easier to maintain smaller models, correct? Correct. Less bugs, probably. Better quality, because at least we have some control over it. And it's a little bit more work, fun to work with. Because, you know, software development field is not easy. Everyone can agree. But working on big models, it's essentially being a sadomasochist. So smaller models are work better. So what's in the heart of domain-driven design? Focus on solving business problems. And there will be three concepts, ubiquitous language, bounded contexts, and context map. And let's, let's go into them. So ubiquitous language is the really important thing. So ubiquitous language is essentially language that is used between and uniquely at some certain context and is understood by everyone across developers, architects, business experts, clients, and across departments. What does it mean? If you hear experts saying invoice, or maybe, let's say, place order, so you shouldn't have in the code base create order, because the, we are placing orders. It's kind of important difference, yes? We shouldn't get fancy with having our own names. So the language that spokes in a domain should appear in documentation, code, QA tests. It should be uh, spoken by everyone, and we should know what uh, uniquely it understands. It, it, uh, it communicates. It's perfect for preventing communication, and it helps to avoid corporate version of the broken telephone game, which I will show in two slides. But you can't explain ubiquitous language on its own. Ubiquitous language makes sense when you have as well notion of bounded context. And bounded context is nothing else than having a part of the system in which you use, we use the same ubiquitous language. And there will be an example now. So imagine we have this web application, okay? We, we just sell books. We can place orders for them, okay? So we can have, we will have two pieces. We will have a web application, and we will have as well CRM system, okay? Now, in a, in a web application, we will have a notion of a user or a visitor. Someone logs in with their email address, we'll have their password, first name, last name. Make sense? Makes sense. And most probably on the, when we talk about catalog, this, this book's catalog, we will talk about the visitor or maybe a user. OK, so it should exist everywhere there. But now, once this visitor places order, what happens? Magic happens because they pay us, one thing. But then we go to the CRM system. And in CRM system, will we use the same word? Will we use user or a visitor? It's a CRM, customer relation management system, yes? Even though it's the same identity, we treat it differently depending on the context we are in, okay? Language gives us the boundary for those two services. In this boundary of the web application, we will use a notion of user and visitor, and we will focus with the simplified model on the, what's important for the catalog, and in this part, we will talk about maybe invoices of our customer, discounts for our customer, and about customer. Even though on the conceptual level, in the real life, they are treated as the same identity. Make sense? So now we have two contexts, and the language gives us the boundary between this. That's what bounded context is, and why you can't explain one without, one without the other one. And I really like this, this word, the Yagoda. So you know what Yagoda is. Obviously, it's this. 
if you are Polish, it is. So this is, the, I, I am not kidding, this is Jagoda in Poland. I have no idea. It's the ubiquitous language. But obviously you thought about this. So now just imagine, because it's a funny, 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 funny thing, unless you are Polish and you, you go to Bulgaria and you buy Jagoda cake and you are allergic to strawberries. Have fun with that, okay? You can die, all right. But this is fun, you know, this is real life. Now let's talk about product. Because in corporate world, you can have the product, the same thing. So you come to the kitchen and you hear two people talking about, one talks about product, the other talks about product, and they, con they have a conversation. And then you hear, you listen to them, and then you realize they talk about completely two different things. So who have heard this? Who have had this kind of uh, overheard this? Many of you. Why? Why they, they, they were just thinking about their own context. They weren't conscious about this. So the context gives, gives this language. And, you know, we can die in the real life, like this example with the Agoda, but on a professional level, when we try to develop a model which leaks to other parts of the context, we essentially have a gigantic mess, yes? And we know that's no fun to work with. And there is a telephone game I mentioned. So uh, in the Domain Driven Design book, there is this additional nice feature just that we should kind of avoid and uh, how to help to avoid. So usually we have this. We have a customer says, I want blue X, Y, Z. And then they talk to expert, I want this. And then to analyst, I want this. And the analyst says this to architect, I want this. And then it goes to team lead. And finally, it goes to developer and QA. What are the chances? By the way, uh, kids are playing this game in the kindergartens on one word only, like Apple and then Unicorn comes out on the other end, yes? What are the chances we implement correct thing? By the way, this is not a COBOL developer, just I use an icon available, okay? What are the chances we get the right result on the other side? None. So, sure, we can implement red ASD, obviously, what, but we will work in iterations, so we will have a beautiful scrum, and we'll just go through this insanity many times, yes? Is it agile? No, it's not. No, what, so why are we continuing this madness? Who have seen this? Yeah, many of you. <laughs> so, I will, uh, in two slides, I will tell how to avoid this or prevent. Now, there is one ubiquitous language per bounded context, okay? How to document ubiquitous language? So ubiquitous language should be visible everywhere, just to sum up. In the code, UI, documentation, requirements, and in spoken language, okay? And we can put it, publish this as a, uh, on Confluence as a glossary. We don't want to, I, I don't usually put over here bounded context or ubiquitous language, we have like a service licensing and we have a glossary. And then there is a term and there is a definition of it, which is signed by expert. And, every, and we use this because then there, are, there is no ambiguity, okay? By the way, uh, I work on a, on a system uh, in a company where like few companies were bought and they brought uh, with them to their own licensing models. So in one big system, we have three licensing models. So we have two pages, one licensing context A and B, and we have their own glossary, and in both of them, we have something called the license. They are nothing related, okay? We don't have to be unique between the, uh, the languages, the, the different ubiquitous languages. This is a very simple idea, okay? You can think of bounded context as countries, because they may or may not be similar language, like, you know, like Polish and Slavic are very similar, but they are not. You can sometimes use, uh, find a word that makes sense in uh, Polish, which is uh, to find, if you try to translate it to Slo Slavic, you, you will essentially use vulgar word in the other one. So they may or may not be uh, visible. There are very specific ways of how to communicate. We have different APIs and contracts. So in EU, we just have a passport or just maybe ID and more or less we can move, move around, okay? However, if you would like to go to USA, 
you need to have or just somehow get visa. Okay? Then you need to come to airport, they will scan you. There is a specific contract and protocol how to achieve this. So uh, the, uh, there, is, there, is, uh, there is, they may or not be a way easy, uh, a easy way of passing boundaries. And this is a place where I would like to explain distributed monolith. Because what distributed monolith is, is essentially microservices. Just imagine those countries as microservices. And I have this kind of uh, problem at hand. I live in Poland, and now I wake up in Poland, fine. Then I do groceries in Sweden. Then I come back to Poland. Then from Poland, I drop my kids to Bulgaria to kindergarten. Then I come back to Poland and go to work in London, come back, and then I just visit all the places, okay? Because there is no locality. So distributed monolith is essentially this. People think they do microservices, yet they don't take care of boundaries and pri private privacy of data and their models, and they end up with suboptimal communication patterns, okay? This is the third thing, because we have many bounded contexts which are small, okay? We will have, we can now draw a context map. And the context map is something that allows you on a first glance to understand what's happening. So here, what I like the most, I like the integration between ads publisher and billing. Zero code, perfect. That's the best integration we can have, okay? By the way, how many of you have uh, worked with distributed systems? More like half of you. Okay, how many of you have this kind of map of services and their communication? Less, okay? You, sh you should have it, okay? But what's it, what it is good for? Obviously for onboarding new people, that's fine, okay? But on the first glance, we know who, which part communicates which, which one. And this is very important to know, okay? So when we have context map, we, stare, we can start to talk about specific APIs that we craft between those and communication patterns. But the hardest work now currently, especially in the buzzword, maybe microservices is not, not a buzzword anymore, but is to find the proper boundaries of bounded context, okay? How we can fix this telephone game? Uh, obviously, we need to build our ubiquitous language and find proper boundaries, and the very nice idea is to use event storming sessions. So, who have heard about event storming sessions? Many of you, uh, not many of you, but this is like the, the place where we bring experts, developers, everyone int interested in this piece of uh, software, we bring them to, uh, to fix the knowledge gaps in between them. Then we can build our language and we can have a greater chance of finding a proper boundaries. There are other ways. However, this is a very good starting point. Whatever strategy is used to find those contexts and the language, obviously the, do the knowledge should come from the domain experts. Okay? That's the most important thing. Now we have a context mapping. So we have, many, we have this context map, and we need to communicate between them. So those are essentially flavors of the APIs. And in the blue book by Eric Evans, there are many kind of mention over here. However, I would like to just explain to you this one. We don't have more time for this. So we have anti-corruption layer, and we just imagine we have bounded context one and bounded context two, and just imagine here, is let's say Poland and there is Bulgaria, and here we have anti-corruption layer. So if Jagoda flows over here, we should translate it. Okay? So we should translation should come over here. So then we don't want to use Polish word Jagoda over here because we will do mess. Okay? And we don't want to uh, use this Jagoda meaning over here. We need when communicating, we need to translate it. This is essentially integration point. So those, all of those are flavors of different integrations and anti-corruption layer just as, a, as an example. It's in the book, it's not easy to understand. However, once you have acquired quite a lot of experience, it will make more sense, okay? Now, let's go to second part, what's really important, and this one is fun. So is it clear 
what's the difference between strategy and tactics? Many, not many people. It will be very nice, very nice example is of the professional poker players, okay? Just imagine you have a, a professional poker player coming into casino. And there are seven tables where they would like to obviously earn money. They don't want to lose. They would like to win, okay? Do they go to the first table and start to play? No. They go around, they try to figure it out which of the tables has the weakest players, because that's the most value for them. So they can go and find the weakest table, they will observe for some time, and finally, once they will use this strategy, they will sit by one table where their weak players are, called the fish in poker, and then they start to apply their tactics by all the tricks in that, in that, uh, in that table. However, why it's important? Because imagine if there are seven tables, and there is only one table where all the players are better than this guy, okay? If he didn't do strategic look, and he approached the worst table for him, even though he could win on all the others, he, lost, he would lose on that one. So even if he would apply his tactical patterns of poker by the best table, which is the worst for him, maybe the whole, he would lose money that day, okay? So that's strategy. And what's the difference? So strategy is the big picture, choosing the right core of the domain. What makes money for us, okay? Now, the core domain is the one that identifies or makes, uh, make having, uh, gives competitive advantage to your company. So that's a core of the domain. And if you identify the core domain in your project, then you, we should use and invest the best people over there, most effort, best patterns, better coverage, maybe better pe penetration tests, and we should take care of this more, okay? Not all the domains are of the same importance. So we have limited budgets and time. If you don't have limited budget and time, just let me know. I will be interested in that. R&D is always fun. How should we, f so where should we focus our, our efforts? We can use so-called T-shirt sizing, okay? T-shirt sizing is pretty known to everyone. So over here we have bounded context one. It gives us a very small competitive advantage, S, and implementation is effort is large, so the value is just divi divided value. And then we just get a very small t-shirt, okay? So this is probably not our core. But over here, we have a competitive advantage large, implementation effort is medium, so our value is XL. This is most probably where we should focus more than on BC1, okay? So in this case, BC2 is our important stuff, core. I like to think about bounded contexts and domains like this. Can you identify core? <laughs> yeah, exactly, someone mentioned C. So this is our core. Whether it saves you money or makes you money, this is what is important for this company, okay? This one is questionable and those three are not so important. Now, remember what I mentioned that uh, anemic domain model, which is kind of anti-pattern. Can you, if you would choose where we could uh, survive and be fine with using anemic model, I'm not having any problems putting uh, and using anemic model over here in E as it's not so important. So it doesn't give us a lot of value. Maybe it's not so important. So I can focus my efforts over there in C where it makes sense, okay? I like to think about this. And by the way, when, uh, when I started my like, journey in 2007, and uh, I s started to clearly see that I want to work on challenging things. Challenging things are over here. And those are give you the best value because then you are more valuable for your company. Now let's talk a word of the subdomains. We will have three times. Subdomain is essentially broken down larger domain into small focused, smaller focused areas, and there are three. One, 
Core, this is, we talked about this, it's essential use, uh, business differentiator. For example, like secret AI model. Now, you should think about core in a way that if you take core or it dies, the company collapses, let's say. That's kind of like how core is important. Then we have supporting. Supporting is essentially important, but it's supplementary functionally it is. So it's something important, but we would survive without this, okay? And I like the third one the most, which is generic. Those are essentially common features, often standardized. For example, payment processing, accounting, and invoicing. So this is very good, because what we can do over here, we can buy it off shelf. It doesn't give us any competitive advantage. We need to have it, like payment providers or accounting. Let's use something. Let's integrate with something. So over here, if you come back over here, so for example, this is not our core. Maybe we can buy it off shelf, okay? Why spending our own time on this? So obviously we should prioritize resources and people's time on efforts based on subdomain types. Now let's talk about specific example. So what's core in OpenAI? So can, uh, can, you, can you tell me what's the most important thing from OpenAI? What's core of their business? Chat GPT, okay? So that's their core. We, can, can it survive without chat GPT now? It appeared thanks to this. This is their core. Okay, so now the question is, what's, what's, uh, what's a supporting domain in, uh, in OpenAI? I thought of DALI, okay? It's important, for example, for generation of images, you know, for photographers or some people working with images and so on, okay? However, is it that important? Can uh, this uh, company survive without this? Yes, it can. Is it core? We can't say it's core. Was it introduced immediately? No, after a few months only, okay? So this is kind of supporting. And now what's generic? So if you bought like your license for yourself from OpenAI, so you will now know that they use all things, all things related to subscriptions and invoicing and payment goes for Stripe. I think they, uh, it looks like someone spent like five days on implementation, max, because it sucks, this kind of, I mean, don't like this integration. However, so they put it off shelf. Why should they, what should they should, they don't care about payments. They just would like to get money. They don't know how it's done. This is a perfect example of how you focus, clear laser focus on what's really important, okay? Now, Let's say that finally you identified your core. Now, that's the time where you should focus, or maybe not, but now that's the decision that you should use tactical domain-driven design. And maybe you can employ those things in the core and maybe in some parts of supporting ones. But now you can knock yourself down with aggregates, aggregate routes, entities, value objects, factories, repositories, application services, domain services, policies, events, specifications. Now is the time to do that, okay? Domain-driven design is not really about anything related to code. It's just the way of thinking. Now, some of the benefits of domain-driven design increases the chance of the project success because we are focusing our efforts where they should be, what gives us value. And enhances, I will repeat it, it enhances your professional value. So if you work on a financial system, for example, and you acquire a lot of domain logic, you are more valuable to this company, but as well you can bring it to another financial uh, company in financial sector. Your value increases. And it provides satisfaction in seeing effective results at some point. And by the way, support scalable and flexible architecture. So what I mentioned about the bounded context, if you will be able to finally see your boundaries and identify between your bounded context, it's much easier to implement microservices because you take those and as a starting point, you can just turn one bounded context into microservice, but then it's a, it's a good starting point. And obviously, this is a talk about DDD, so I will mention how we can use AI for our DDD journey. Uh, I thought about a couple of things. So first of all, 
uh, there is not easy way of accessing uh, experts, you know, experts' time on the domain you work on. Probably it's not that you, you can just approach him or her every time you want, okay? So to ask uh, where to use better uh, to use better your time when you have with experts, you can start to use LLMs to learn about the domain you currently work on more. So you can ask be better questions, okay? You can check your models against AI to get better results. For example, alternative approaches for, for your model you found, or maybe identify anti-patterns once you start to use your tactical patterns, okay? Or you can prepare better notes with meetings and with domain experts, obviously, prepare better documentation without misspelling errors, and you know, more posh English. You can start to create a context map using, for example, Structurizer DSL, because if you can turn code into diagrams, then uh, you can essentially generate yourself nice context, you know, nice context maps. And you can suggest you some edge cases or things to discuss with experts, and identity help to identify bounded context boundaries. So finding possible, uh, and this one is the, mo uh, the one important, you can use it to find specific generic services for something you were about to buy, uh, about to implement by yourself. If you find yourself that a part of domain is not that important, you know, maybe you can buy it off shelf because uh, otherwise we would have to pay uh, in our implementation for it, okay? So you can use it. Is there a service for this and that? For example, for document verification system, you can use DocuSign or PandaSign or any kind of uh, whatever you want. Probably there is a service for, for this. So it's very easy now, nowadays to find it. There are some reference. Obviously, Blue Book, very hard read. This is a red book, which is Principal Patterns and Practices of Domain-Driven Design. It's uh, as, normal, uh, as normal software IT related book. It's only 700 pages long. But uh, 150 is focused on domain-driven design, bounded context, and strategic design. And 550 is essentially C-sharp code with a lot of pictures and tactical patterns. Anyway, it's easy to read. It's really good uh, source to start with. Tactical patterns, because we are on the Java conference, so obviously I will put a link to Microsoft, but they have pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, articles about to domain, uh, tactical domain-driven design. And as well before mentioned, anemic domain model uh, described by Martin Fowler. All right, there is a contact on the left side, slides on the right, 